Welcome to week 4 and uh, we are in the last session. So uh, today's session you can assume that it is kind of a summary session for all the sessions that we have uh, done till now. And also as per as the choice of the topic is concerned, it is also one of the last topics to encounter when you are uh, into the interaction design process. But uh, when we mean uh, it to be the last topic does not suggest that it is a topic that we can neglect or can pay less attention. In fact, it is one of the most important topics that we should be considered with uh, respect to uh, design of interactive product. If you remember, uh, I have said earlier that it is always good to evaluate your designs because when you do evaluation, you get a confidence in as, as an interaction designer and not just a personal confidence that uh, you gain as a designer the design itself becomes much better out of the evaluation because out of these evaluations you get to know a lot of things which would be difficult to know otherwise. Okay. So, let us see what do we mean by an evaluation. Have you all been to um, uh, different markets and I am sure at times when you are having uh, some uh, a snacks at a refreshment counter or some mithaiwala shop, you may find uh, some of those to be tastier while some of those not to be that tastier. So, that aspect of taste is an aspect of evaluation and you may end up saying that I like this gulab jamun or I like this chocolate and it is somewhat sweeter or it is somewhat uh, less sweeter that is the variation in the evaluation. Okay. So, as human beings we are always in fact at most of the times we are evaluating, we are constantly evaluating inputs uh, through our sensory systems and evaluation in that sense uh, if you think of it as a framework and if you look at your screen it would require at least three things to begin with. The first one would be the object that you are interested in evaluating and the second one would be the process or the method that you use to evaluate the object. But even when you have these two things in mind, you must have a motive to evaluate that is the purpose behind the evaluation. So, this purpose defines the kind of method you are going to be using for conducting the evaluation. If you have a purpose of a certain kind, you would use a method that give you uh, readings uh, that fulfill that purpose. While if you may have a purpose of a different kind, you may altogether be using a different method for the evaluation. So, to begin with keep in mind that for any evaluation to happen, we need three things. First one being the object, second one being the process or the method which is deployed to evaluate the object and the third one is the purpose behind the evaluation. And if you can imagine there would be two different ways you can evaluate, you can, you can do subjective evaluation or you can do objective evaluation. Subjective evaluation if you look at your screens are with respect to one's experience. So, an experience of a taste and whether something is saltier or sweeter is an expression of a subjective evaluation. It is closely tied with one's experience and if you can imagine our experience with interactive product is also one of those kinds where we either are satisfied with the experience or are sometimes dissatisfied with the experience. So, our experience also can be subjective with respect to the interactive product. And if you look at several examples which are placed on the screen, you would find that you know subjective evaluation is fairly applicable across different domains and in a variety of ways. So, just to begin with, uh, how was your experience with this pan? Okay. That is something, let us say that you have an interactive pan and you want to evaluate how is the experience of the user who is using this pan to write on the tablet. So, you could pose a statement or pose a question like how was your experience with this pen and then in response to that question the user may be saying 
yes it was satisfactory or it was satisfactory up to a certain extent or I was dissatisfied. So, these are all different variations of responses that you may have as an answer to a question like that. And then there are different other questions which uh, are uh, directed towards giving you a subjective evaluation. For example, did you like the sound of these speakers? Remember the time when you were purchasing speakers for your uh, music system. I think people are very subjective there. And would you like to come back to visit in this water park? You may have had a visit to a recreational park or a water park and then when you are exiting or when you are done with your visit, you usually get a uh, feedback document. And most of the time what it says is that would you like to come back? So, that is also one of the subjective evaluation question. Objective evaluation unlike subjective evaluation is independent of one's experience. So, for example, results from a chemistry lab uh, just like a titration, you note down the reading and maybe a performance of a vehicle over a period of 6 months or a year you note down different parameters of that performance. Uh, performance of a computer's processor uh, that is also an objective evaluation. Internet speed, how much upload and download speed is the processor or the computer able to achieve or let us say number of visitors to a particular site. All these are independent of one's experience and can be objectively collected. Uh, so, you can also imagine that if you have a subjective evaluation and if you want to do an objective evaluation, you would use fairly different kind of methods. So, you have methods which are just suited for objective evaluation while you have methods which are just suited for subjective evaluation. Once again, since evaluation is something that uh, we find always uh, uh, a little uh, difficult. So, I am going to reiterate that for you. Evaluation, the triangle that you have seen requires object, process and method to evaluate the object and the purpose of the evaluation. And then in the next two slides what you have seen that evaluation is of two types, subjective which is dependent on one's experience and then the object is which is independent of one's experience. So, subjective and objective evaluation and once again if you were to do subjective evaluation you would use a different method. Then if you were to do an objective evaluation you would use a different method. I think with this understanding let us move on to the next slides. So, if you were to transform that understanding of evaluation framework into design evaluations this is what we come across. We can replace object by interactive artifact or uh, interactive product and then we can replace purpose by let us a few uh, characteristics that we are very much interested in uh, like usability, experience or design in general. And then we would choose a appropriate method or a process to uh, evaluate the interactive product. So, when you are conducting the design evaluation, you are uh, in a position to conduct this evaluation in two different ways. Uh, consider the example of interactive pen again. Now, this pen, if you interview the design team of this pen, they would tell you that they have followed a rigorous process behind the design and development of this pen. As evaluators, we can choose to evaluate this design while they were designing it that is part 1 or a different purpose could be that we choose to evaluate this design once it is complete. Okay. The former part where we were evaluating the design when it is in the process of design and development is called the formative evaluation process because it helps you uh, generate insights and test results during the formative, during the design and development stage of the product. While if you test this after it is built or designed in all its great details, you are doing the summative evaluation. That is you are doing a goodness test. How good is the pan with respect to 
other alternatives or with respect to other iterations. So, when you are doing con, uh, design evaluation, it is uh, suggested that you pay a rigorous attention to formative evaluations because as a design team member or as a, or as a designer yourself, formative evaluations will help you improve your iterations. Whatever you are doing next should be better than the earlier done iteration. So, if you conduct formative evaluation test, then that objective is achievable. You can still make your iterations better and better. Okay? So, you have to do formative evaluation. Now, from measuring goodness of design, once again summative evaluation to improving the design, that is the focus of the design team. Now, one of the aspects as you had seen in the earlier slide, the usability experience and the design in general, the one of the very essential aspects uh, which a lot of these formative evaluation methods uh, are focused on is of the usability. So, let us understand the definition of usability from ISO uh, working group on uh, human system interaction. What they say is, Usability of a product is the extent to which the product can be used by specified users to achieve specified goals with effectiveness, efficiency and satisfaction in a specified context of use. So, this is ISO's working group uh, definition of usability. So, you can see that there are few important keywords which are surfacing up. The what these keywords are effective, efficient and satisfactory. Okay? So, if you can imagine the design evaluation methods which are based on formative design evaluation, they would consider these three keywords very rigorously. And we are interested while we are doing the formative evaluation, we are interested in knowing whether the iteration that the design team has just produced, whether that iteration is effective efficient and satisfactory. So, these are the three different goals that we have when we are conducting the formative design evaluation. Now, let us look at these evaluation methods. How do we choose them? Uh, if we have several methods, how do we say I want to use, I want to use this method versus the other method? Okay? So, there are different parameters, there are different dimensions that you may like to consider. One of those dimensions to begin with would be what is the purpose of the evaluation. Again, that becomes if you imagine the triangle of uh, the design evaluation framework that I had shown to you earlier, purpose of the evaluation is a key dimension. It helps you choose which evaluation method you want to deploy. Okay? So, you have to consider purpose, then by whom, for what? for whom should I do this and how much or how long. Let us look at these dimensions one by one. So, when it comes to the purpose, summative evaluation, once again you may uh, conduct a summative evaluation where you make claims about an interactive product, about its goodness. Okay? So, one of the claims could be, let us say that we are considering an interactive television, a claim like the one shown on the screen. This interactive television is rated 5 star by the users in comparison to other televisions. That is a summative evaluation claim. So, that could be the purpose okay? or the formative evaluation with insights to inform design iteration. Okay? So, for example, 70 percent of users still could not achieve their goals by using this interactive television and hence design needs to be improved. So, that is a formative evaluation statement. So, you have to very precisely find out the goal or purpose of your evaluation. So, that is the first dimension which will help you choose the evaluation method. And within the scope of this course on NPTEL, once again we are considering the formative evaluation method. So, our goal here is to understand methods which will help us improve our designs while we are designing or developing them. The other dimension would be by whom? Okay? So, you have to consider you know who is going to evaluate 
the design? Is it the expert or the real users? So, for example, if you are considering experts, you would have to consider a method like heuristic evaluation, which will come later in this uh, session. So, and if you are using real users, you can use a different other methods. So, by whom? It means who should be considered to evaluate the design. That is also the other dimension which you have to um, make sure that you know about that. And then for what? Uh, choosing the evaluation method. So, what for what? What kind of measure? You know, what is the attribute that I am interested in? Am I interested in, in the satisfaction score or am I interested in finding out uh, gray areas in the design where users commit most of their mistakes? What is it that I am interested in? What are the attributes that I am interested in as a designer or a member of a design team? So, evaluating the per performance, noting down the problems, so moments where users commit errors or have a deficiency of information to complete the task are all these different attributes that I may be interested in. So, that also you need to bear in mind. And for whom? What do you think is the audience for the evaluation results ok. So, you might do an evaluation test and you would get results out of the test, but what do you think are the audience of those results? Are these the members in the team? Are these uh, the members of the design team, engineering team, development team, management team? For whom are these results important? So, we have to also pay an attention to this dimension. And then how much or how long? You have to always consider resources available to you when you are choosing the evaluation method. For example, heuristic evaluation might prove costlier than design walkthroughs. So, how much and for how long is the estimation of the resource on part of the person conducting the design evaluation? So, budget, time, money, uh, how much of these things are available? How many people are there in the team and number of users that you can uh, get access to uh, with respect to the evaluation, availability of other resources, maybe the infrastructural resources. All those things are a measure that you would have to be considered when you are deciding to choose one evaluation method versus another. Let me give you an example. You might be interested in knowing how does a particular banking application perform on an Android tablet. And if you want to consider 5 users at a time, uh, then you would have to have 5 Android tablets at, uh, at your disposal. So, in that sense, do you have that resource available to you? How much and how long? Okay? So, these are the different dimensions which have to be considered or have to be detailed by the team interested in the design evaluation. Once you have detailed these dimensions or have a good understanding of these dimensions, you can choose a particular method. Now, let us start considering these methods one after the other. The first method that I am going to uh, detail before you is the verbal report or think aloud evaluation. What is happening here that you are asking your users to verbalize their interactions with the interactive artifact. So, here, if you are doing this, the method has the ability to record how users are using the system. And it is a window to see the contents of their short term memory. Remember, I had said to you earlier in one of the sessions that our short term memory is fairly limited. In fact, human beings can only store close to 7 plus minus 2 as per an earlier understanding and 4 plus minus 2 as per the new understanding, improved understanding of uh, short term memory. So, a number close to 6 to 7 is what our short term memories can store. So, if you were employing a method like think aloud protocol or think aloud evaluation method, you gain access to knowing what is there in the short term memory of the user. Okay? How do you do that? You ask your users to verbalize their interactions. Now, this is very interesting and there might be at times if you were novice in this method, you might commit certain obvious mistakes. What you might be doing? You might be intervening in between the interaction that one should not do. And also, you should be considering 
to record these protocols while the task performance is ongoing. Let me give you an example here. Suppose that I am interested as an interaction designer, I am interested in knowing what really is happening in the mind of the user when he is composing a message on the SMS application. So, I would ask user to verbalize his interaction when he is composing a message on the SMS application. Let us say if I am the user, I would verbalize as I am doing the task. So, this verbalization and task performance should happen concurrently. Let us see an example here. Once again, I am the user who is going to look at the screen and going to compose a message on the SMS application and here it starts. Okay, so, here is the messaging application. I click on the application. The entire application opens up and uh, then uh, where is the icon for compose a new message? Mm, okay. Oh, yeah, here it is. So, the, this icon is on the, uh, on the bottom uh, right corner. I click on this icon. Oh, oh, no, this is not the icon, maybe there is some other icon. So, I need to go back, I am going back, oh yes, I am back to the main interface again. Oh, I see, yeah, here is the icon, yeah, it is, it is, it was so, it, yeah, it is somewhere hidden here. So, I, I, e, there. Okay, so I am, I, I get a message window and let me now type the message. Okay, and maybe I will include a, I will include a icon here, okay. Okay, and now it is time to send the message. Oh yes, the message is getting sent. Okay, so this was one protocol, this was one verbal report and once again if you notice, you can play this video again, you can notice me doing this task. I am verbalizing as a user as I am doing the task that is very much important. You should make sure that your user verbalizes while performing the task itself. So, that is one of the essential conditions for your protocol to be a fruitful uh, protocol. Okay. Be careful about that you have to present task in as much clarity as possible to the user and minimum intervention is required. You tell it very precisely to your user that this is the task. If you have any problems understanding the task, please ask me now. But once the task starts, uh, I would not be intervening unless it really is the major breakdown of the task. So, you have to resist yourself as a designer to intervene to help your user do the task. That is not something which you would do in a uh, verbal report evaluation process. So, minimum intervention is required and include no leading questions. If you can play back the video where I was trying to act as a user and uh, perform the verbal report uh, evaluation method, imagine that there, wa there was a designer next to me who would be you know helping me out intervening. No, you are actually that uh, icon about compose messages there, you are not really seeing that. I if those interventions, if those leading questions and uh, hints and cues would be coming while I am interacting, my verbalization would be disturbed. Okay? So, you have to make sure that you are uh, intervening uh, not at all or if at all required minimum intervention uh, it should be exercised and also there should be no leading question. Now, clear your doubts and if as a designer you have doubts. Uh, because you are audio visual recording this session perhaps and if you have doubts about the manner in which a user is completing the task, you can clarify those doubts once the task is completed, once the verbal reports are received. Okay? So, this is how you conduct the verbal report evaluation or think aloud evaluation and you can then analyze the content, you can record this entire interaction can analyze the content, can write it on, transcribe it again and write it on a paper or digitally type it and then you can analyze the content. See if there are different themes emerging out of the verbal reports because those themes will give you an indication of uh, changes or modifications which have to be brought in to the design to make it 
better. So this method of a verbal report, it can be performed at any time during the design and development process of the interactive product. Now we are moving on to the next method which is the questionnaire based uh, evaluation method. This method uh, just like the verbal report uh, evaluation method, this method also can be performed at any time during the design and evaluation process. Once again we are doing formative evaluation methods, okay. So that is why we are saying that can be performed at any time during the design and development phase of the interactive artifact. What is the condition? You should have clear questions in mind, okay. Very specific and concrete questions are required where you are composing the questionnaire. And if you are composing the questionnaire, you can collect subjective response to different questions against a specified scale. So what you see on your slide is the specified scale where you have neutral right in the middle of that scale and on the right side of the scale you have agree, strongly agree, on the left side of the scale you have disagree, strongly disagree, okay. So this is a balanced scale where across the center of the scale responses to the left are balanced with responses to the right. So against this scale you can put up a question and you can seek response from the user. Okay. Now it can include a number of items against the against which responses are required. So in, in terms of scalability, questionnaire uh, can include a number of items, not just one or two. Maybe you can go up to 10 or 12 or 15 of these uh, questions. But once again, be precise, specific and concrete in terms of composing those questions. So an example of such a question would be, uh, let us say as a user you have uh, used a particular system and post your usage you are given this questionnaire where one of the statement in the questionnaire is, I think I would like to use this interactive product frequently. Since I have used the product, I may disagree with this statement, agree with this statement, uh, strongly agree or strongly disagree or I may choose to be neutral, okay. So this is my subjective response to a statement which is written above the scale. Once again, the next statement could also be, I think that the information presented was consistent. As a user, I can, I can choose to give my response on this scale from being strongly disagree on the left hand side to being strongly agree on the right hand side. So, all, so this scale is applied to different statements which are uh, which are talking about different attributes of the interactive artifact. Once again, include specific questions and not the generic ones. And ask questions which are based on actual system usage and not on hypothetical conditions, okay. So if you have designed a prototype and prototype could do few things, you must ask your users about those things which the prototype can do, not about those things which the prototype it is still incapable of doing. So let us say if you were to say that imagine that this is happening and then you read this statement and give your response. This is a hypothetical situation. On the other hand, if you tell your users, since you have used this, would you like to read the system? Would you like to read the system across this statement? So you have to always base your questions on actual system usage and not on imaginary or hypothetical situations. Useful interpretations come from concrete and specific questions, okay. If you have been using hypothetical situations, you will get responses because the user would, uh, he may oblige to give response, okay. But can you derive interpretation which is useful in, in sense of improving the iteration itself? That is, uh, that is something which would be uh, a far possibility in that case. So useful interpretations always come when you have a concrete and a specific question. Once again look at your screen, there is an example which would illustrate this point. What do you think is the most difficult step in transferring of funds using internet banking, okay? Versus when do you think you would call the customer care for help in case of an online transfer of funds, okay? The first one is a bit specific and concrete while the later one is hypothetical. Uh, in the first one we are saying since you have used this particular uh, part of the 
uh, application. What do you think uh, about this step uh, versus saying that when do you think this will happen? When do you think you would do that? That is a hypothetical situation, imaginary situation. So, this example is listed before you to, uh, to bring out that point that interpretations, useful interpretations will only come when you have questions which are specific and concrete. Now, the third method is a design walkthrough method. Okay? Uh, it is uh, meant to collect feedback to design prototypes by offering a design walkthrough. Walkthrough as a, uh, as a term, if you can imagine, it is like going through the design, going through distance, different steps uh, of the task, going through, going through different uh, parts of the design. Okay? That is why we are calling it a design walkthrough. So, while you are offering a walkthrough, you have the opportunity as a designer to get the feedback, to receive the feedback from representative users, from experts, from other members in the team. So, you need to include representative end users, others also can be included. So, for example, members of the design team, development or engineering team, even uh, usability experts, you can include them in this design walkthrough process. Most fruitful when used early on in the design process. Once again, a clear indication that we are uh, paying more emphasis on formative evaluation methods, methods which are helpful in the formative stage. All these methods, if you use them early on in the process, you get more insights and more opportunities to improve your design. The scope of this method is fairly wide. Okay? From paper prototypes to low fidelity prototypes which have very fewer design details to very high fidelity prototypes with a lot greater design detail this method is applicable. Okay? So, what you see on your screen is, is a paper prototype. So, even on a paper prototype, this method works. Use prototype to walk through a set of typical end user tasks. When you are offering the walkthrough, you should consider typical end user tasks and that should be the emphasis of your walkthrough. So, offer a design walkthrough which includes typical end user task. Okay? Let people identify problems and make suggestions for modifications of these design. Okay? So, so, imagine that it is almost like you are showcasing before them how a particular uh, task would be done and then you have an audience which includes representative end users, experts and members of other teams. That audience is helping you out to uh, find problems with your design and also suggest alternatives if they can. Okay? So, encourage peer discussion whenever required. If possible, quickly sketch those design modifications or design alternatives and then reformulate your design walkthrough and offer it back. Okay? So, that you can see whether the design walkthrough works with a newer design alternative or not. Okay? So, in that sense, if you can see, this is a fairly uh, much, much uh, valuable method if you are working in a team. You can do this quick usability evaluation, quick design evaluation uh, by just considering your peer group, by considering some representative end users. And it is a low cost method and gives you fairly interesting insights about the improvement of the design iterations. And I am showing few of these uh, paper prototypes before you now. So, you can see the designer here is not only, uh, in, he has not only detailed different uh, uh, functionality of an application, he has also written below the application. Okay? And uh, what is happening in that particular screen, he has written there. Okay? So, by using this, he can very well offer a walkthrough to the entire team or to and group of uh, or to representative group of end users. Okay? Once again, you can see another prototype in place. The last uh, design evaluation method I am going to detail before you is the heuristic evaluation method. If you can recall, we have used this method, we have understood this method during the research phase as well, you know, where we are doing the critical competitive review, where we are trying to review uh, design or the intended product with its competitors. But if you were to review different iterations, 
this method is still is a very fruitful method. And what is happening here, once again I am going to repeat for you, uh, you may not be in a position to go back to the research uh, video, uh, so let us uh, do a quick repeat here. In this heuristic evaluation, experts weigh a given design against a set of uh, heuristics or thumb rules, okay. And in the next slide we would see what these thumb rules are. And uh, experts with similar profiles is something that you should be considering as a design evaluator because this is a review by the expert and if the profile of these experts vary too much then your reviews are also not in sync with the uh, objective of the test that is to generate insights to the iteration, to generate insights for improvement of the iteration, okay. Double experts are usually preferred. If your expert is a usability expert plus he is also expert of the domain that is preferred. Assume that you are developing a medical care application and if you are reviewing your iterations through a usability expert versus you are reviewing your iterations through a usability expert as well as a medical domain expert, then in the second case you have a possibility to receive more fruitful design review. So, that is why double experts are usually preferred, experts which are not just uh, an expert of the usability, but they are also expert of the domain of the application, prefer double experts. And, and usually a number of 3 to 5 experts is just sufficient, okay. So, this is more or less about the logistics of this uh, heuristic evaluation because at times it is a costlier method. And these are the heuristics which are uh, being proposed by Jacob Nelson. Uh, visibility of system status, match between the system and the real world, user control and feedback, consistency and standards, error prevention, recognition rather than recall, flexibility and efficiency of use, aesthetic and minimalist design, help users recognize, diagnose and recover from errors, help and documentation. Against these thumb rules or heuristics, you can ask your experts to review the iteration or a given design solution. And the strength and limitations of the existing design uh, solution can be found out. This is one of the outcomes of this method. Once again, if you are using it in the formative evaluation uh, process, when the design is into the design and development phase, when the interactive artifact is into the design and development phase, you get to know the strength and limitations of the proposed design solution. Current scope of the design in terms of interactions and other elements of user interface design, all different elements because if you see the heuristics, they are talking about recovery from errors, they are talking about aesthetic and minimalist design which is the visual design framework, they are talking about efficiency of use, they are talking about user control and feedback, freedom, they are talking about match between the system and the real world, visibility of system status, lot of these things. So, this is a fairly exhaustive review of the design, not in terms of uh, money, but also in terms of time. But the advantage is that you get to cover the entire range of functionalities, including interactions, data elements, functional elements, everything in a heuristic uh, evaluation process. So, that is where I would like to sum up today's session and uh, I wish you best of all with your uh, interaction design course and I wish that a lot of you come back and appear for the exam. With all of these things, I wish you best of all and hope this course was interesting for you. Thank you. <music>